All right, so we'll do some applications of nested quantification. And you know, the first one will be just simply, we'll go through some words. Uh, one of the things that we ran into calculus is the definition of a limit. And so when they say the limit is x approaches b, and so if we would have a particular function and say here's b, and I'm just saying that the function itself approaches l, what happens here is this idea of forming a box around the point. And the horizontal axis, the x's, are your independent. Your vertical, your y's, or your functions are your dependent variables. So I have independence of making balls around b. But on the other hand, I don't have anything in terms of vertical. I'm dependent. Once I mess with this, my height is fixed. And so what happens for the idea of a limit is you're going to approach something. Okay, what does that mean? That means that if somebody would come in here and give you a, you must be this close to L. And that's what the epsilon is, right? You need to be within epsilon of L. If you're going to, you're telling me that you approach L, you better be within L. What do you mean? Well, if any, if I gave you any epsilon, you should be able to get close. Well, how do you get close? Um, the way that you get close is to, you're free to pick a delta distance from B such that every number in there, in other words, we have these, this entire box is going to be filled in such that if you're close to B, then the box essentially height-wise shrinks to the size that they gave you. That doesn't matter. The function is always going to be very close to L as you get through it. And that's the idea behind epsilon delta, right? The idea behind epsilon delta is just to simply say that you get close to something, if they fix the heights for you, you can shrink the widths until inside this box this entire function curve exists and is very, very close to L. And so the, one of the things you could ask is, well, what does it mean for it to be not true? Well, if it's not true, then it's not what you just said. And so I go, well, what does that logically mean? Well, that would just simply mean that's I could take this negation through each of those quantifications and so okay that means that there is going to exist some sort of epsilon that's positive that's all this is restricting such that for every delta that you picked that was positive there would be some x within that ball such that it is not the case that if the x's are close to b then the function is going to be close to L. That means that if they're close to be within the ball around B, then the box doesn't close up. The function is always, so if they, they have some sort of epsilon that they've picked, that no matter how small you make the width, the function is always outside of it. And this normally happens when we get these sort of jump events that, you know, once they pick it small enough, I don't care how close you get, the box, you know, the function is going to be outside of that box. It's outside of the vertical component. In other words, this implication is not true. Well, implication is not the first or the second, but if I were to, get, to take the negation through, it becomes not not or the first or becomes and not the second. So this would be logically, there is some epsilon that somebody's given you that is not negative. And no matter what delta you try that is not negative, there's always going to be a place in the box or exists some sort of x such that the x is close to b, and this is not true. Well, to be not less than means that the function minus l is greater than or equal to epsilon, which means it's outside the ball. So one way we could look at this, and now I can start to say, when do you not have the limit? Now, well, I don't have the limit when you're asking me to be close, and I have all this freedom to get really, really close to b. There's going to be some place where the function is outside of what you just asked me to do. So, and then you can imagine that happens that, oh wait, if you're gonna call this L, I'm gonna make a box around here, doesn't matter. There's some X values here that doesn't matter how small you make this, they've fixed your height, that this function is outside the box. So obviously that is not a, that has no limit. So that would be what I just said, would be the verbal definition of that particular thing. And so we can use logic, we can use quantifications to be able to, along with English, to try and understand what we're working with. Um, another 
feature of normally when we're given English and we want to go into symbols and so all I am given is so what I just did where I spoke this and didn't write it that was symbols into English on the other hand if we want to go to English into symbols and we would have just a sentence a lot of times we are not given the propositional functions we don't know what the predicates are we don't know the universe of discourse so if we do this we are going to have to um, basically find out or one way to do that is you know make reasonable guesses or choose in a reasonable way one uh, what are the predicates you know if I would have a sentence could you figure out what's actually being tested what's the predicates that we're talking about once you have the predicates you have propositional functions and from that you're gonna have to figure out what's the universe of discourse and usually this is natural they don't state it because you just had a sentence so from the sentence or the, it's nested in a bunch of sentences what are we talking about? Are we talking about the ints? Are we talking about the reels? Are we talking about birds? Are we talking about ravens? We have to figure out what are we talking about that are going to be stuffing into propositional functions that are evaluated by predicates. Once we know those, uh, we're going to have to figure out things like uh, what are the object binding? In other words, if I use, these are words like all some some sort of specific choice so if I say things like mark or the number three right you're specifically saying what it is that's evaluation but what if they say the word all well now I'm gonna I'm gonna universally quantify it I'm gonna bind it to all of them what if they say the word some well I'm gonna bind it by the existential and then once we figure out where the alls, the sums, and the examples of the predicates and the universe of discourse for the propositional functions, we start to see parts of this is all in an English sentence. The next thing we're going to look for is operations, right? Do we see if? Do we see then? Do we see and? Do we see or? Do we see unless? Do we see but? All of those sorts of things, right, are operators that eventually are going to be coming symbols within our work. And once we figured all those sorts of things out, let's go ahead and create and check. The symbolic form. Go ahead and write down what you think it is, right? Put it in symbolic form, some for alls and all those other sorts of stuff. And then check to see if it makes sense for what the sentence is actually talking about. But all of this thing of tearing it apart and trying to figure out the predicates and the universe of discourse, these are all rather freeing. And picking a good or a bad universe of discourse can possibly cause you problems. And when we go through problems of this nature, you know, you're just you're going to have sometimes you just have uh, simple sentences. So if I would say things like, um, let's say example. No, let's not do everyone say no one loves math 321 and so I look at this and I say okay um, that's my sentence all right no one loves math 321 and I'm trying to go okay what seems to be predicate the predicate seems to be this idea of loving right so it, look, it looks like this is going to be a, a two area so I might say use what we did love square triangle and it's going to be square loves triangle and I'm going to have the universe of discourse for since it's no one I'm assuming people so the universe of discourse of the first position I'm talking about is pe all people and the universe of discourse of the second position is all classes all right, so that seems reasonable. I mean, it seems like this is the predicate, the propositional functions. It seems too airy. It seems like a reasonable universe of discourse, people and classes. And then we can go through here now and then move to the next thing. It's like, how are things bound? Well, one is it definitely looks like one binding is just evaluation. You know, Math 321 went into the position of class, so that's just evaluation. The other one is this no one. And nobody is the same as and this is one of the things is that an existential or is that a universal 
And so one thing we can note here is that none is the same as all are not, right? So if I would say no block is red, I would, I'm actually saying all of the blocks are not red. If I say no one is happy, I would say I'm actually saying that all people are not happy. So none or a no one or a never is actually a all. So it's actually a universal but negating the predicate. And so what's happening here is to say that, okay, no one says that that's a for all. So for all people, it is not true that the all people or any so no one for all people we have no love of math 321 now if i wanted to i could go ahead and take this negation out and say this is logically saying you know what's not true that there exists a person who loves i don't use the word loves it's just love love p math 321 so i'm using evaluation I'm also using binding and that, that if you look at that it makes like you know no one loves math 321 is the same thing so it's never true that there exists a person who loves math 321 so it's a short version of that and so this is one way that we can go through this particular problem is you look at it and you try to tear it apart um, let's do another example and let's do an example from the textbook say the sum of two positives is positive. And I, I'm going to go through here and say, all right, um, so I'm talking about numbers. I'm going to assume that I'm going to be talking about any possible type of number. And so any sort of real, so one predicate is the idea of, actually the only predic, predicate I see here is being positive. So I'm going to go ahead and create that positive of a number denotes x is positive. And I'm going to say that the universe of discourse of, say, x is real numbers. And I'm going to look at any possible real number. So, and that's what I'm going to use for this. And so sum is an operator. It's just an addition of two things, and this is. So if I look at this, this is actually implication. So, you know, given two positives, if I would add them together, it's necessary, right? For it, this is, there's a necessity feature, right? The sum of the two positives, if I would have two positives, it is absolutely necessary that when I add them, it's actually positive. So I have an implication here. So it looks like that if we would take this and I have two numbers, so for any possible number, let's call it number one, and I'm going to get for any possible number two, don't know, that I have two properties. If they're positive, so if number one was positive and number two was positive, then that would imply that their sum is also positive. And so that would be the sum of any two positive numbers is positive. So the first thing that we have to check is that we have positive. So we pick any number, any number. If they're both positive, then their sum is also going to be positive. On the other hand, one of, this is also a really good example that if we would play around with a different universe of discourse, of x is only a positive real, so I only have a positive number, then this doesn't even have to be done. I already know it's positive, so that's not even necessary. So this simply becomes simpler that for all n1, for all n2, then when I add them, it ends up being positive. And we look at this and say, well, 
these are two solutions <laughs> to the same statement, right? They're, these are two ways of writing it. And one is if I have a much more open universe of discourse, I have to narrow down what I'm talking about and then say what I'm what I'm happy. To. So it needs to be positive. On the other hand, instead of narrowing it down in the logic statement, I could just narrow it down in the universe of discourse and just only talk about positives. Then I, then I don't have to worry about that narrowing and just jump straight to the conclusion that's necessary. It's one of the things where, you know, like we do in most things in life, if you talk about, if you restrict what you're discussing to only what you're interested in, the reasoning becomes easier to work with. If you take your universe of discourse and keep it complicated, you know, a bigger thing, we a lot of times have to restrict it before we do some work to it. And so that makes the logic a little bit more complicated. Both are correct, right? Either you handle the restriction within the universe of discourse like we did here. If you do not handle the restriction within the universe of discourse, you have to handle it within the logic statement itself. Now, if you were only given this sentence, which would you pick? Would you pick the more the simpler universe of discourse with the more complicated logic? Would you pay, take the universe of discourse that's restricted, that's tighter, that's more complicated in a way, and then you have a simpler logic? Well, it really gets down to what do you think is reasonable or what I'm asking you to literally do. You really need to be able to do both but you need to understand why you would pick one over the other and when would these make sense for you to actually do that. So these are some examples about going back and forth between the language into sentences or sentences into the symbols. And it's one of the kind of nice features of this is it allows us to think in a very firm way about ways or way things are working and it's one of the, the issues of, of what this actually kind of does for us when I've talked about like discrete kind of helps us re rewire our brains. Many times when we're doing things, we're stuck down into a, a process of kind of guess and check in things that you do in life. What we do is we start off with these kind of simple game-like questions and they might not look simple to you because you have to think about it, but they're ones that we can formally do within you know, minute, half hour, you know, an hour, having discussions with other people. And we start to change how we think. We start to change into a teardown process. What's the, what is the feature of this that's actually doing the testing? What's the predicate? What's, what's necessary for me to work with here? How are things weaving together? And we start to, as we start to work within this, we start to be able to apply this formal thought process to other things and it's a good way of, of building out our ability to solve problems is going through these techniques and it's kind of like people use chess and checkers to think about how you do real-world competitions you know this idea of game theory which are just simple games like chess or checkers how does that lead you to discussions of how economies work and people interact in a competitive way it's like well they're not playing chess but the idea of what's better what's worse I want to do what's good for me and bad for you or good for you and bad for me that thought process is developed through this so it's one of the reasons why you want to go through every example in this section and do as many as the problems and not accept what you see as if it's an answer but rather put it into your own thoughts and put it into your own words so that you understand the reasoning behind it. This form of mathematics is not meant to be memorized. The mathematics that we're doing is meant to be understood, to tore down and put into your words so that you understand it. All right, that'll be it. Uh, there will be no attendance, obviously, because you're going to be doing homework over the weekend, or the homework should be done, and you're going to be uploading it, so I'll see if you've done your work. But I definitely want you to take this, and, you know, you have uh, some time coming up. You know, look at some of the puzzles or the problems that are given into these sections and go through it and think about it and do certain ones in just the idea of, the, of an understanding of I want to formally 
think about these problems. All right, that's it.